Good morning, everybody. I'm Jeff Vaughn, the County Veteran Service Officer, and welcome to the Memorial Day program. We'll get started with the presentation uh, or the invocation by our chaplain, Captain, Mike, Captain Michael Colley, United States Air Force. As we enter into this time of remembrance, I invite you to share in 15 and a half seconds of silence, one second for each decade, from Memorial Day's earliest origin in our nation's history. And now, I invite you to continue to remember in silence or pray in your faith tradition as I pray in mine. Dear God, we invite you into our time of remembrance. We, re we remember our husbands and wives, our sons and daughters, our mothers and fathers. In our memory, we decorate those who died together, those who died alone, those who died for us. In its earliest origins, three years after our nation's civil war, this time of memory, Decoration Day, brought together citizens of a nation who took on the task of neglect. For three years, some graves had been honored, strewn with flowers, while some were left alone, encroached by weeds. But the living, Citizens of our nation refused this division of memory, and in this refusal of division led to a decision that all service members of this nation, our nation, be honored, decorated with flowers on this day. We honor all because all are not forgotten, and all have died as sons and daughters. So let us live and lay this decoration of flowers with a renewed commitment to unity, for it is in our name, the United States of America. So let us be united, because we, the living, our sons and daughters, husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, and let us decorate our lives with what the dead died to give us, freedom to live in unity. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain Cully. Now, if you're able to stand, please stand for the posting of the color guard. Posting of the colors, my apologies. Color guard, post the colors. Now, if you'd please join me in the reciting of our national anthem, followed by uh, the reciting of the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by our national anthem. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce the Franklin City Mayor, Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Ken Moore, for some comments. As we celebrate our freedom, I have two stories of sacrifice, both during different times and with different outcomes. The first story starts from an old church bulletin shared with me from friends. It was a 1944 Franklin Methodist Church bulletin. Yes, it was during World War II, and the intent of the bulletin was to be able to mail it to the deployed troops and inform the congregation of their addresses and identify those that were killed in action or missing in action. There was a strict requirement that it in the envelope should weigh no more than half an ounce. You'll recognize some of the names that were on the deployed list, such as Bethurum and Berry and Isaacs and Pinkerton and Coode and Smithson and Small. The list for killed in action was much shorter and had names such as J.W. Waldron, W.A. Robinson, Vance Burke, and Clarence Mara. I also learned that two MIA listings that were on this list later moved to the killed in action list. One of the features of the bulletin that caught my eye was a popular Franklin figure and physician, Dr. Harry Guffey. I don't know the exact sequence of events, but only a short time later on December the 19th, 1944 was a black day in Franklin. Word got out that Dr. Guffey had been killed in action in Europe and the news was flashed across the screen at the movie house and soon all of Franklin knew. Fortunately, one month later, his wife received a letter from her Harry. He had been wounded he was captured at Normandy Beach and was one of only 32 in the 3,500 member 84th Division to survive the invasion, and he was a prisoner of war of the Germans. He was confined to a four-foot square cell with just a peephole. As you may recall, he was a very fit athlete. He played college football. He captained the Vanderbilt football team and he weighed a muscular 185 pounds, but in confinement, he was limited to bread and water and his weight dropped to 118 pounds. When the Germans learned of his medical expertise, he was assigned, along with another American doctor, to take charge of a concentration camp where there were 8,000 women of multiple nationalities. Fortunately, for many of for his patients, he was freed at the end of the war and returned to Franklin to resume his medical practice. In my eyes, he returned as a hero for his dedication, but to my knowledge, most people didn't know what he had endured. 
No one will ever know what mental and physical scars he might have. He was part of the greater generation, the greatest generation. And just a few years ago at this same event, I met Serena Arachaga. We chatted after the event and she talked about the loss of her husband in Afghanistan. And as our conversation concluded, those of you who know some of the military traditions, she put in my hand a challenge coin. I look at it very often because it reminds me of the sacrifices made for not only my freedom, but your freedom. It's one of those moments I'm never going to forget. But I wanted to read her words that appeared in a publication, and these are her words. It was a Tuesday. You, you could call it a normal Tuesday, except it wasn't. I arrived home to yet another tough box on my porch. This meant the end of deployment was near because his things were coming home. On my third trip to unload the truck, a car pulled up. A white Impala, I think, but I refused to believe what I thought was going to happen. Two men dressed in blue approached me asking if I was Serena. I told them I wasn't, and they had the wrong house, and they needed to leave immediately. Then they asked me if I was the wife of Ofren Arachaga. Ma'am, the Secretary of the Army regrets to inform you that your husband, Ofren Arachaga, died of wounds in Kunar Province, Afghanistan, 29 March 2011. She went on to write that our fallen heroes are the reasons we live in a privileged nation, where we get to sleep safely and soundly in our beds every night. This is one of the many reasons they deserve this one day to remember their service and sacrifice. I thought it was very fitting that after his third deployment, he celebrated with a tattoo. And the tattoo was only the dead have seen the end of the war. These two stories are from different times and ultimately one story ends up with no death. Contrast the feeling of those two families and the fact that they both suffered greatly from the sacrifices of their loved ones. We can only imagine the pain and anguish they experience. Both stories make me proud that I am an American and appreciate the freedoms I enjoy and you enjoy. May God continue to bless these families, our families, our city, our state, and our country. And now our County Mayor, Rogers Anderson. Memorial Day teaches us to teach and remember. It's about honor and duty and remembrance for all men and women who have served our nation, specifically in remembering those that died so young, those that died in combat, those that died defending our freedoms so we could enjoy life as we know it today. It's the right thing to do for our soldiers. We, as veterans, understand that being a soldier is hazardous. But we don't expect it to be our sister or our brother or our mother or our father that won't be coming home. Most that return home share that they were the fortunate ones, that the real heroes are the ones that didn't return to their families. It is days like today that we teach and educate and remember those who died in our great nation. Two world, two world wars, Korea, Vietnam, multiple wars in the Middle East, and many conflicts have resulted in over one million who have died 
and pay that ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. Today is Memorial Day, a day that we recognize those men and women that have given the ultimate sacrifice. But occasionally, we have someone in our community that needs to be recognized, and that's what I'd like to do today. He's a 102-year-old World War II veteran. His name is Jay Opie. His name is Jay Opie. He was a corporal, and he was in the United States Air Corps. Let me read just a short bio. In the spring of 1942, a 19-year-old boy, still in high school in New York, he entered the military service and was assigned to the 2nd Troop Carrier Squadron 443 Troop Carrier Group stationed in Burma, near the future southern junction of the Burma and the Lado Roads. Until the completion of the Lado Roads by the U.S. engineers, the Burma Road stretched 717 miles from Lashko to Burma to Cummings, China, and was the only, only land route for logist logistic supplies to the Chinese National Army, fighting against the Japanese in southern China. Construction on the road began in December of 1942 in India. Total over 1,000 miles in length, a portion which was described as 400 miles of mud, and it was completed in May of 1945. The road provided a shortcut, shortcut across the norm of Burma and rejoin the Burma Road at the foothills of the Himalaya Mountains and south of the distant Chinese border. After being transferred to group headquarters in 1943, Corporal Opie completed 38 months in the China India Burma Theater and returned to the States and a civilian life in 1945. He was employed by General Motors until his retirement in 1979. On his 80th birthday in the year 2001, he enrolled at a local high school, tended the necessary classes, and completed requirements to earn his high school diploma. Last month, <laughs> last month he turned 100 and two years of age. Ladies and gentlemen, he is sitting on the front row. If he's able to stand, he deserves a hand. Thank you, Mayor Moore and Mayor Anderson. If you could please stand, if you're able, for the laying of the wreath. With the honor guard, please come forward.
Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. <clears throat> Next, I would like to invite Mr. Rich Kraza he, to share his thoughts on Memorial Day. He's the president of the local Vietnam Veterans of America chapter and an all-around good guy. And we'll, let's, let's hear what he's got to say about Memorial Day. Good morning. I'm honored to be here on this solemn occasion to remember and honor those veterans that we have lost. In planning my remarks, I was going to go online with my good friend Google and grab all sorts of statistics to incorporate into my speech. But after giving it some thought, I realized that anyone could do that. Those that we remember today are more than just statistics. Each soldier supported our country. Each one has a story. Yesterday, I drove out to the Middle Tennessee State Veterans Cemetery on Recorey Lane. I sat in silence and gazed out over all of the white headstones of my brothers and sisters that I never knew. Some were killed in battle, while others passed after they came back. While their names, experience, and branches of service may be different, what they had in common was a conviction to serve and protect our nation. They are our national heroes. But let me tell you about a few of mine. Richard Rudolph Zedek, my uncle Rich, was my mother's brother, and he was also my namesake. He served during World War II in the Army Air Corps as a tail gunner on a B-17. He was killed while on a mission over Europe. I never met him but I would hear stories about him from my mom and other relatives. I still look up to him and call him my hero. Uncle Rich was one of the reasons that in 1966, I enlisted in the Air Force. As most of you are aware, the Vietnam War was ramping up. And like my Uncle Rich, I wanted to do my part. After basic training, I was assigned to tech school to learn to become a Morse intercept operator. While that may be an impressive title, what I was taught to do was to listen to Morse code and copy it on a typewriter. Unofficially, my title was a ditty bop. <laughs> After training, my first deployment was to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines, but my job was on the ground. I was stationed there for 18 months where I met and worked alongside Michael Leon Stiglich. Big Mike, as he was known, was over six feet tall and over 200 pounds. He was from West Virginia. He was one of the friendliest people you could ever know. After my tour in the Philippines was over, I volunteered to go to Vietnam where my job would be a little different and I would be on flying status. Our mission in Southeast Asia was Airborne Radio Direction Finding, ARDF. We flew an unarmed, electronically modified World War II C-47 aircraft, known as an EC-47. Once we could pinpoint a target from the air, we would call our position into the ground. Mike had followed me to Detachment 1 of the 6994 Security Squadron, in Nha Trang, Vietnam. Big Mike and I flew over 100 combat missions and many of those together. I returned to the States in August of 1969 after a year of deployment. Since he had arrived after me, Mike had to finish his year of deployment. In October of 1969, 
Sergeant Michael Leon Stiglitz was flying a mission in a plane that crashed. And he was killed. The next time you visit the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C., you will find his name among the over 58,000 listed. I call him my hero. I had the occasion to go to Gettysburg once and take a guided tour of the battlefield. Standing on the ridge overlooking the empty field, I could picture the troops storming across the open area to claim the high ground. I cannot imagine the courage and bravery that it took to fight for what they believed in. Take a tour of the Franklin battlefield and you will witness the same thing. All of these people, men and women, mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, shared one thing, their love of country and our way of life. While we focus each Memorial Day on those killed on the battlefield, I feel we need to also honor those that were able to return home, but later passed due to complications of exposure to chemicals in the war zone. War changes people, some physically, some mentally. My uncle Tony Fusick, he was my father's brother-in-law, returned home from World War I, but passed away years later from the effects of mustard gas. I never met him, but he answered his country's call to preserve freedom. I call him my hero. While in Vietnam, I served with Tommy Dean Pedersen. Tommy made it home from the war, but passed decades later from cancer attributed to Agent Orange. Tommy had this knack of locating fellow squadron members spread out across the country and some overseas and convinced them to attend one of our reunions. Tommy greatly helped me with putting on reunions for our Air Force squadron. I feel that there is at least one of our alumni that is living today because of attending a reunion and realizing that they were not alone. I attribute that to Tommy. I was fortunate to get to know Tommy better over the years, and we became very close. I call him my hero. Being a life member of both AVETS and Vietnam Veterans of America, for which I'm a president of this local chapter here in Franklin, I have met many veterans that have since passed all too soon because of what they were exposed to on the fields of battle. Our military pledged an oath to protect our country, including giving their lives. Some did so on a battlefield like Uncle Rich and Big Mike. Others like Tommy and Uncle Tony gave their lives years later. As you leave today, look at the pavers laid out before us and read the names on them. Drive through Mount Hope Cemetery and look at all of the graves with a flag on them. Take a drive to the Middle Tennessee State Veterans Cemetery on Mercury Lane like I did and look at the white headstones. While some of the lettering on those stones has been mostly worn away over the years, it teaches us that these people had the same strong belief in our freedoms so many years ago that we have today. These are our heroes. While we are saddened by their leaving us, we should remember them and thank the Lord for people such as them. In closing, I have a request. Take a moment today to think of your Uncle Rich, your Big Mike, your Uncle Tony, your Tommy. Say a silent prayer and thank them for their sacrifice so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we have today. Thank you.
Usually I mention it up front, some comment about the weather, because usually the sun's about 300 feet from here, and uh, it's just, there's no escaping it. But today is a beautiful day, and I'm glad that we have the, the weather for it, and I hope you all are enjoying what we've got. Uh, the next part I want to talk about is the pavers. Uh, as you looked in, Rich talked about those on the pavers here are Williamson County residents from different wars, different situations that have given their life either in defense of the country or served as veterans. And now their families have honored them by placing their names on these pavers here in the park. So if you get a chance to look, and if you notice that on some of them, there's similar names. Um, there's a lot of fathers and sons, brothers, cousins out here. So it's a pretty great thing. This year, we'll be, we've added 28 pavers. And as I said, they're from different times in history. We have 17 of them for uh, U.S. colored troops that fought for the United States during the Civil War. We have one uh, Revolutionary War veteran has been tracked down that lived here in Williamson County and the remainder are veterans that have served at any point in time since then. So as we uh, honor these pavers today, May Mayor Moore and Mayor Anderson will come up and read the names of the pavers that we've added this year. Lloyd Lee Locke, Doran Post, Sergeant of the Army Corps, 1919 to 2015. William Greenwall, First Lieutenant U.S. Army, 1938 to 2022. Robert M. Boyd, United States Army. 1927 to, to 2021. Harry L. Dugan, U.S. Army, 1946 to 2022. John Duncan, Captain of the United States Navy, retired 1949 to 2022. William D. Marrero, Private First Class U.S. Army, 1945 to 2022. Bob W. MacArthur, Corporal in the United States Army, 1932-2023. William Mitchell, RM3C, U.S. Navy, 1925 to 2021. Frederick Davis. Private and Revolutionary War, 1748 to 1831. John Perkins, U.S. Colored Troop, enlisted 1864. The following we do not have dates for. Samuel Banks, Private, United States Colored Troop. Pleasant Banks, Private, U.S. Colored Troops. Miley Harris, Private, United States Colored Troops. Samuel Barnes, Private, U.S. Colored Troops. <coughs> Thomas Patton, Private, United States Colored Troops. Abraham Winstead, Private, U.S. Colored Troops. Thomas McLemore, Sergeant, United States Colored Troop. Moses Nelson, Sergeant, United States Colored Troop. Breckenridge, Robert Breckenridge, Private, United States Colored Troops. William Scales, Chief Bugler, United States Colored Troops. <coughs> Derek, Derry Armstrong, Private, United States Colored Troops. Anderson Sharp, Seaman, United States Navy. Alfred Fields, Private, United States Colored Troops. Edmund Boxley, Private, United States Colored Troop. Joseph Swanson, United States Colored Troops, Private. Joseph Matthews III, Private, United States Colored Troops. And finally, Mr. John Porner, 
United States Colored Troops, Corporal. Would the flag folding detail please come forward? The flag is being presented <clears throat> to Mayor Anderson, and he will be presenting it to Corporal Opie for his service to this country. Detail. Stand by.
Color guard, retire the colors. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll please remain standing for the benediction by Chaplain Colley, followed by the playing of America the Beautiful. Let us pray. And now go, confident in your freedom, that is your gift given to you by daughters and sons, fathers and mothers, husbands and wives. In the name of God we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Now, as we come to the end of the ceremony today, I'd like to share something with you. We've come here today in a very formal way, in a very dignified way, to honor those who've given their all for all of us. Now, as I see some military-affiliated hats and family members out in the audience, I would ask you to do this. We've done the hard part today, and now let's do the good part. When you get home, 
your veteran had a favorite drink, a favorite meal, a movie he liked or she liked, and a song that might make a deaf dog howl, but it was one of their favorites. So go home and listen to that song. Drink that drink. And remember them. Thank you for coming today. Have a great day.